Welcome and welcome again to another edition of uh, Secrets of Meaning, the podcast and TV show arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address. And as you know, these podcasts are designed to explore some of the issues that impact ourselves, our communities, and our families in light of the revolution in longevity. You can uh, check out our website, jewishsacredaging.com. And if you want to contact me with ideas or suggestions, just email me at rabbiaddress at jewishsacredaging.com. Known to many of us um, is one of the most um, challenging issues that face our generation right now, not only our generation, but our kids and grandchildren, that is dealing with Alzheimer's and dementia. Uh, what we're being told on and by every expert is the uh, expected and real growth in these issues uh, over the next several decades, especially as uh, our generation ages out. Uh, here to talk about uh, a brand new book about this and some of her own experience with this is Lisa Skinner, and we welcome her from beautiful Napa Valley. Uh, Lisa is a behavioral expert in the field of Alzheimer's and dementia, and uh, the focus of uh, some of this conversation is, be, uh, is going to be on her uh, recently published book called Truth, Lies, and Alzheimer's, Its Secret Faces. So Lisa, first of all, welcome. Welcome to Jewish Sacred Aging. I hope this finds you well. I hope you're enjoying life in Napa Valley, one of the more beautiful places in the United States of America. So thank you for joining us. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Well, welcome, welcome. Let's, let's get right to this. Um, the um, subtitle um, of this is uh, The Unconventional Path to Peace of Mind for Families Facing Alzheimer's and Dementia. Like, obviously, the, the key there is the unconventional path. So let me just start right with that. Is what, what do you mean by the unconventional path for families and individuals facing this? It's an unconventional path. <clears throat> because a lot of the best practices for responding to uh, people suffering from one of the brain diseases that causes dementia, and there are over a hundred known brain diseases that cause dementia, the best practices are actually counterintuitive to the way that we instinctively think we should respond to some of these behaviors, such as a false belief. So it's an unconventional path because the things that I teach people and um, really how to uncover the best quality of life for somebody living with dementia is unconventional to what they may perceive it to be. Um, what an example is a lot of people who live with dementia have false beliefs. And what I mean by a false belief is one of the very common things that occurs is somebody living with dementia can honestly believe that their spouse is still alive when they actually passed away several years before. And they start talking about that spouse as if they're alive and well and waiting for them at home. And our instinctive as you know, family members, adult children, our instinctive reaction to that false belief would be to correct that person and try to steer them back into our reality. And I say our reality because we know that that person is no longer living. But the person suffering from dementia 100% believes that person is still living. So the best practice approach to that situation is to do what we call join their reality and acknowledge what they're saying. Because if we were to correct that person in that situation and say, oh, mom, don't you remember dad died five years ago? That might come across to her like she's hearing it for the first time, that she had no idea that her husband passed away. Nobody told her, they've kept it from her, and it could actually lead to what we call a catastrophic reaction. So to avoid it escalating into a really difficult situation, we want to join her reality by acknowledging whatever she's saying and going along with it. Um, you know, uh, 
all of us who've dealt with this, either professionally or personally, um, have walked this walk, especially on, on how to de- how how to deal with, um, you know, exactly what you're talking about, acknowledging, supporting, as opposed to correcting. Right. Um, what what drew you, Lisa? What what got you involved in this? What's your story? What you just, uh, well, you just woke up one day and said, yeah, I think I'll become an expert in dementia and Alzheimer's. The way I explain it to people is I followed the yellow brick road and it led me here. So I have always been fascinated by human behavior. And long story short, when I was in college, I took a course and I fell in love with um, human be- the topic of human behavior, and I ended up getting my degree in human behavior. My very first experience with Alzheimer's disease was with my grandmother, and I was a young teen when she developed Alzheimer's disease. Now, this was back in the 70s, and um, it was less understood then than it is now, but a situation happened. My grandmother really displayed kind of the gamut of all the extreme behaviors that are associated with this illness. She had the delusion. She had the hallucination. She was paranoid. She um, saw things that weren't there. So she was living alone, and she was calling the police two or three times a day, reporting that there were birds living in her mattress that came out at night and pecked at her face, that men were trying to harm her, that people were breaking into her house and stealing things from her, that she saw rats running along her walls. And she was she was calling them many times a day. And of course, originally they sent the police out to check out her claims, never found any evidence of anything that she was talking about, and finally tracked my mother down. And we only lived a few miles away from my grandma. And I happened to be home when they came over. And they said to my mother, they said, you need to do something with this woman. She is a nut. We can't keep responding to all these crazy claims that she's making and I knew my grandmother wasn't a nut she was the sweetest little lady in the world and we all knew there was something wrong with her of course back then they called it senile dementia but I was infuriated over the way that police officer was just trying to dismiss the real situation believe my grandmother was a nut case And I really took offense to that. So since then, I have had seven more family members succumb to brain disease. Five of them are blood relatives and three were through marriage. So I have had many, many, many years of personal experience with this disease. It obviously runs in my family. And... Combining that with my fascination for human behavior, and it just kind of accidentally worked out that I ended up with my very first job as a community counselor in an assisted living memory care facility. And my job was to counsel families for um, coming to live and what it would be like to have them come live in, in the facility. I did all the assessments. and. Um, basically did the onboarding for the families. And one of the things that I have realized in the 25 years that I've been doing this is people's lack of understanding of this illness and how complicated and multi-layered it is. Most people associate Alzheimer's disease pretty exclusively with memory loss and confusion, but it is so much more complicated than that with all of the behaviors that show up and um, the signs and the symptomology. And I discovered early on in my career that if I helped people understand the behaviors, identify these behaviors as being part of the disease, because a lot of people don't realize that these things that are showing up are actually the disease. And then helping them understand 
a new way to communicate with people with brain disease and providing them with proper tools, that they would enjoy a much higher quality relationship with their loved one and not feel so much pressure and stress and anxiety because of all the unusual things that pop up on any given moment, any given hour, any given day of going through this journey with their loved one. And it is a long drawn out illness. My grandmother, for example, lived with it for 20 years. And the average is 8 to 15. That's a very long time for people to feel very stressed out and full of anxiety over spending time with their loved one because they never know what's going to come up. So this is what I, um, why I wrote the book. And this is what I um, help people accomplish so when they do spend time with their loved one who's suffering from brain disease, it can be a really great experience for everybody. And they can enjoy the time that they have left to spend with their loved one instead of having it be um, a stressful situation. I, one of the interesting things about uh, what you've done in the book is the, is the glossary and, and at, towards the end, you write about uh, I think five or six a a words that um, you you caution people about aggression, agitation, anger, anxiety, and apathy. Those are it's a pretty heavy menu. Uh, what do they have to do with what you're talking about? Those five a words. These are all part of the behaviors that are associated with brain disease, and. I think one of the most important things for people to understand is the five A words um, happen because people with cognitive impairment reach a point where they're no longer able to articulate their wants and their needs to us. They, they can no longer verbalize if something's wrong, if something's bothering with them, and these are triggers of those five A words. So to diffuse those behaviors from happening or avoid them altogether or um, to minimize them, you really first need to understand and, and what behaviors to look for that are associated with disease, disease and then understand um, how to effectively react and respond to them in a positive way to minimize the situation from escalating into a more serious situation. And that this is part of the disease, and that most people who suffer from dementia, and when I use the term dementia, I'm referring to all the behaviors and the right. symptoms that show up. It's, it's a term used to, to, to describe all of the symptoms, and they vary from person to person, um, that they're not intentionally trying to be difficult or mean unless they have one of the brain diseases that affects the area of the brain that um, damages impulse control and reasoning and personality. Uh, then we see some of the more extreme behaviors like swearing and lashing out and hitting and things like that. But for the most part, people are trying to tell you something. And it's our job to recognize the behaviors, to decode the behaviors, and to learn what the trigger was for that particular behavior at that particular moment. So you really have to kind of go through the process of elimination and determine what is going on with this person that caused them to do this to get your attention to let you know that they have a want or an, an unmet need? Maybe they're too hot. Maybe they're cold. Maybe they're in pain. Maybe uh, they're hungry. Maybe um, there's uh, something ha going on with their clothes that's uncomfortable for them. They're trying to tell us something. And it makes our job difficult because we have to figure out what that something is. But that's typically why these behaviors show up. And this is their new way of communicating with us. So what the way I like to explain it to people is it's very common for older 
adults to suffer some degree of hearing loss. And what we do is adapt our way of communicating with them based on their hearing deficit, whether that be sign language or get them a special telephone or get them hearing aids. We figure out a way to have better communication skills with somebody who doesn't hear so well anymore. Well, this is kind of a, a, a real perfect comparison to somebody who's suffering from brain disease because they reach a point where they can't communicate with us the way they did when they were healthy. And they're trying to tell us something. So we need to learn new skills and a new way of communicating with them to meet that deficit that they're experiencing. And the way they're trying to tell us something is through these behaviors that show up as a result of the damage being done to the brain. And then it's our job to learn the new language and the new way and interpret what the meaning is behind what they're trying to tell us. Okay, so Lisa, sense? yeah, yeah. But that, that leads to the next question because there's millions of people who are living this right now. Yes. Um, where does somebody go who perhaps may hear this and they're just entering this journey? Where does somebody can where does somebody go to learn how to understand these behaviors? Well, the Alzheimer's Association. Well, is that a good place to start? Um, because everybody who will experience this, in my experience, they they will react differently. It's very individual. Uh, give me a tip for those caregivers who may be frightened to really frightened to figure out how am I supposed to figure out and decode all these behaviors. If a family is considering placing their loved one in a professional care environment, like a memory care facility, those one of the key things to find out is what type of training those caregivers have received and what the ongoing training looks like, because it's very important when you're dealing with this particular disease that caregivers are trained on these responses and how to communicate and how to diffuse um, behavior from escalating into more serious situations. Uh, but if you're caring for somebody at home or they're still living at their own home and you're visiting them, then yes, the Alzheimer's Association is an, is an excellent resource. They have a, hot, a hotline you can call so if a situation comes up you can call them and there are people on the other end who can guide you through difficult situations there's a lot of information on their site but this is the biggest challenge for caregivers and family members because it's such a complicated illness and there are so many unpredictable things that show up that it really almost takes you know a, a huge learning curve to be able to um, effectively know how to react and respond to these things. But yeah, for the average person, uh, the Alzheimer's Association is a great place to start. And of course, my book talks about everything that we've just been talking about and, and gives, you know, kind of fundamental um, guidance on uh, how to respond and um, why these things are occurring. I think that's another thing that's really important to understand is why are these things happening? What is happening to this person to cause them to believe that there are birds living in their, their mattress and coming out and pecking at her face? And um, so I think that that's probably the... Um, the place to start is understanding the fundamentals of what is actually happening to the person who's living with brain disease and know to, how to identify those as part of the disease and then um, tools to help you effectively respond to them. And not every situation is the same. You can have somebody uh, display a behavior and you try one technique and it doesn't work 
So you need to maybe try something else. So there's definitely um, a lot to know about living with this disease because it's very challenging. And as I said earlier, it goes on for a very long time. So it's a long time for, for family members to, um, you know, kind of walk this journey with their loved one as it is for the person who has the disease. We're speaking with Lisa Skinner, a behavioral expert in the field of Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, the author of a recently published book, Truth, Lies, and Alzheimer's, Its Secret, uh, subtitled uh, The Unconventional Path to Peace of Mind for Families Facing Alzheimer's and Dementia, available at booksellers and obviously on Amazon. And as uh, Lisa was just uh, alluding to, there, there is no paradigm. It, every individual is different because they bring their own universe and life experience and genetic code and family of origin and and that plays out individually so uh that's that even makes the challenge even more let's say challenging which is probably bad english one one of the things that works we're watching and and we're seeing we just, we've had this conversation some with some other guests on on the podcast that really goes to the heart of some of these familial challenges, and I'd, I'd like you to get your take on this, is the fact that as this explodes, I think the Alzheimer's Association is telling us now there's about 6 million people in the United States who are dealing with this. And as the baby boomers age out in the next decade, decade and a half, two decades, it's projected to grow to about 15 to 16 million people who will be dealing with this. And there just aren't enough professional caregivers, geriatricians, experts in this to take care of all these people. We're, we, we're facing a real a caregiving crisis. What, what advice can you possibly offer to a family who just um, is, is in this journey, but they just can't access help? What, how do they begin to deal with this? I've seen this be a huge challenge and struggle for families for 25, 30 years. And I don't know what the answer is. And it's just going to, I mean, I've seen this as the next world crisis, the way things are project are trajecting. Correct, and correct. now there is no insurance that covers care for people with Alzheimer's disease unless they qualify to go into a nursing home, but you have to qualify to go into a nursing home and be covered under long-term care. Right now it's all private pay unless you happen to have a long-term care policy that's already in place before the onset of the symptoms, before the diagnosis. And there is some uh, coverage if you were a vet. Other than that, it's all private pay. And it varies from state to state, but in my state of California, it can cost ten to fifteen thousand dollars to have somebody uh, cared for full time, either in a memory care facility or if you hire caregivers to come into your home. I mean, I've known people that have spent fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars for twenty four seven care at home, right. and it's you know over ten thousand dollars a month in. Uh, professional care environment, like a memory care unit. So to see the writing on the wall, I think something drastic is going to have to change that we go to a different care structure. I don't know if that means that the government helps out or, you know, we kind of have more socialized help um, that's covered by the government. but. This is going to be um, an ongoing problem for many, many, many families. I'm already seeing a shift in care practices since COVID. So in the last couple of years, because the care facilities were hit so hard by COVID and there were so many deaths that, you know, there was a tidal wave of deaths through the facilities and a lot of families are now scared to have their loved ones go into a facility and you know they're scrambling trying to make changes so the residents will be safer um but it's a process and then so they're bringing them into their homes 
but they need to, to be equipped with a lot of the tools that we've been talking about uh, to be able to really manage this disease. And it's so difficult. It's probably one of the hardest care situations that any family is ever going to have to face in their lifetime is taking care of somebody with brain disease versus a medical issue like, you know, cancer or something like that because of the changes occurring with the brain that just really kind of turns the person that has it into somebody they no longer recognize or no longer understand with the behaviors and the symptoms and just all the unusual things that occur. So it's very stressful. It's very difficult. It's um, very complicated, multi-layered. People can be suffering. It's very common for people to be suffering from more than one brain disease at the same time. It's called mixed dementia. So somebody can have Alzheimer's disease happening at the same time as Lewy body disease or They've been having little mini strokes, so they have vascular dementia happening at the same time that they're experiencing Alzheimer's disease, which just adds more complication onto the whole mix. So it's it's a, a very difficult situation, and it's unless we find a cure, it's it's just going to multiply with the amount of people that are projected to develop it in the next, you know, 25, 30 years. Yeah, and as, as you mentioned, as opposed to cancer, where there are recognized treatments and remissions and an increasing number of people who survive, um, unless something dramatic, as you, as you pointed out, as, the, as everybody tells you, there is no cure for this. There's some uh, prophylactic medication, but there's really no cure. Uh, so there's no a cure. whole sort of spiritual aspect of what happens when you get this diagnosis, not only to the individual, but as you was alluded to, and as every clergy person who's dealt with this uh, can testify, this is a family, it's a family systems issue uh, that can, as you said, last for years, and especially with Alzheimer's, decades. Before we run out of, run out of time, just two quick, qu easy questions. Um, not that there's anything easy about this. Well, there, there are probably going to be someone who will be watching or listening to this over the course of the time that people do who are entering this right now, who are, who are just entering this experience of being a caregiver or someone who they love who is dealing with brain disease. What's the best piece of advice you could give them? Understand what's happening to your loved one as a result of the damage being done to the brain and the changes that are occurring in the brain. And then learn about the uh, behaviors that, um, the unpredictable behaviors that show up as a result of the damage being done to the brain. Because in my 25 years of doing this professionally, I still hear a lot of people that don't connect those dots. They don't realize that the behaviors that they're seeing is actually part of the disease. They just think that their person has kind of gone crazy or that it's a completely separate issue from memory loss and confusion that they really relate Alzheimer's disease to. So under, I think that it's really important to understand the fundamentals of this disease and that um, the unpredictable things that show up as a result of this disease. That is a, the, probably the first place to start. And then learn to recognize the behaviors. And then most importantly, figure out how to best react and respond to those behaviors so it doesn't escalate into a more serious situation. And by equipping yourself with tools and techniques to manage this disease, you'll find that you will have a much higher quality relationship and a better experience with your loved one instead of always feeling like you're full of anxiety and that everything is a challenge and this is so uncomfortable and I don't know what to say to her and I don't know how to respond to that because it's going to just suck the life out of you. 
And if you can learn to manage a lot of these things that are so unpredictable and complicated about this disease, it's going to make your journey with your loved one through this disease so much easier. And that Lastly. is probably the biggest struggle I see with family members as they're going through this disease with their loved one is um, just not knowing what to do. So this last question comes up a lot. Uh, again, every, every clergy person who has dealt with this um, either professionally or personally has usually winds up getting asked this question or asking the question. And I'm sure you've seen it in the 25 or so years that you've been working in this. And that is somebody will come out and pour their heart out to you and, and say, you know, um, that's, that's really not my mom anymore. That's really not my dad anymore. Where where does in your in your heart of heart where does that person where does that soul of that person go? Does it go to another level of reality that we do not understand? And if yeah. so Okay, go ahead. So the hallmark of Alzheimer's disease is damage to the short-term memory. There are other parts of the brain that are being affected um, at the same time, but, and this is the entire reason why most people associate Alzheimer's disease with basically memory loss and confusion. So my best explanation for what's happening to their loved one and why they are seeing a lot of these behaviors and a lot of these false beliefs and they end up talking about things that make absolutely no sense to their loved ones so think of the short-term memory as having a switch that can be flipped on and flipped off in the beginning stages of the disease that switch is on more than it's off and the short-term memory is functioning normally as the person progresses through the disease, that switch is on about half the time and off about half the time. Now, the, our long-term memory stays intact throughout the entire disease. By the end of the disease, the short-term memory is pretty much gone. That switch is flipped off forever. And that person then is drawing their memory from their long-term memory. And for each person, where they end up in their past life is different for everybody. I've seen people regress back to childhood and they think they're living, they're six or seven years old and they think they're living at their parents' house and this, is, this becomes their world, this becomes their reality. But in their mind, they believe it and it is their reality, but it's not congruent with our reality so they're not aligned together and that's that makes it the situation challenging i've seen people uh, revert back to like their teenage years i've seen people revert back to the prime of their life when they were in the, the throes of their profession like they were a lawyer or a doctor and their whole entire conversation revolves around that period of their life because that's becomes their new reality that's their world. So understanding that is essential to communicating with your loved one. So listen for the cues because whatever they start talking about when that switch goes off and they're pulling from their long-term memory, it's going to tell you what period of their life they have basically regressed back to. Now that switch, because during the, the mid stages of the disease is on sometimes and off sometimes, you will be able to tell if it's on or off by conversation they're having. If they start calling you by a different name, you know that short-term memory switch went off because in their world, in their reality, they don't have a grown child yet. They haven't even probably gotten married, if, especially if they're six years old and living at their parents' house. They know they know you somehow. They know there's a connection. But if they're only six years old and they haven't 
met their husband yet or had children, there's no way you could be their adult child. And this is right. the world that they're living in because they're drawing from their long-term memory. So understanding that is key to also knowing how to communicate with that person effectively. Lisa Skinner, uh, the author of Truth, Lies, and Alzheimer's, It's Secret Faces. Thank you very, very much for joining us on today's edition of Seekers of Meaning. Um, we wish you continued success. Stay healthy. Enjoy Napa Valley. And um, good luck with the book. Thank you very much, Lisa, for joining us. And thank and you again all for you, having me. Our pleasure. And to all of you, thank you again for joining us on today's edition of Seekers of Meaning, the TV show and podcast arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. If you'd like to make a tax-free donation to help support our work, please go to the website, jewishsacredaging.com, and scroll down to the Donate button. Just follow the prompts. Seekers of Meaning is produced at the Broadcast Center of Lubeckin Media Companies in southern New Jersey, out in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And a big shout-out to our producer, Steve Lubeckin. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address, and I look forward to greeting you on our next edition of Secrets of Meaning, the TV show and podcast arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. In the meantime, take care, everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy, take care of yourself, be kind to yourself. Shalom.